clear that up. Jamil Hill has been a columnist and reporter for ESPN since 2008. That year, the Lakers were playing the Celtics in the NBA Finals, and Hill is a lifelong Pistons fan, which for those who don't know, being a Detroit Pistons fan inherently means that you are not a fan of the Celtics. As she writes it 12 years later, she was saddened to see that the Celtics were no longer as widely hated as they had once been. And she wrote the following, rooting for the Celtics is like saying Hitler was a victim. I can't for the life of me understand what Ms. Hill was trying to do here, any more than I can understand why Deshaun Jackson, a Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver, tweeted on July 6th to his million and a half followers the following extremely strange quote that is falsely attributed to Adolf Hitler. Because the white Jews knows that the Negroes are the real children of Israel and to keep America's secret, the Jews will blackmail America. They will extort America. Their plan for world domination won't work if the Negroes know who they were. It was terrible, and it was so horribly bizarre and bizarrely horrible that it's hard to know how to react. New England Patriots receiver Julian Edelman responded almost immediately by inviting Jackson to visit the Holocaust Museum with him, adding that he would like to go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture with him as well. I don't know if that trip happened, but I hope it did. I'll be honest, after first reading about Jackson's tweet, I didn't think I was going to respond. When I first saw it, I did the same thing I tell my B'nai Mitzvah students to do when a cell phone goes off during their, during their service. Ignore it and keep going. But Hill's article, along with another beautifully written piece by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, made me stop ignoring. Hill wrote the following. Like Jackson, I am black. And had anyone made a remark trivializing slavery, I would have been incensed. I learned that just because I'm aware of the destruction caused by racism, that doesn't mean I'm automatically sensitive to other forms of racism, or in this case, anti-Semitism. Black people too, she wrote, are capable of being culturally arrogant. Now, cultural arrogance is an expression that I had not heard before reading Jamil Hill's article. To Hill, it seems like cultural arrogance is placing one's own people's needs ahead of another's. She proposes that she was at risk of being more aware of a statement trivializing slavery than one trivializing the Holocaust because she is black. But perhaps cultural arrogance can play itself out differently. As I shared earlier, when I first read about Jackson's remarks, I disregarded them. He had seen something on another Twitter account, copied and pasted, or I guess retweeted is the correct term, and it was so ignorant, and it was so out there, that I didn't even need to bother with it. I wasn't going to let this silliness take away from the progress that was being made in honest dialogue over the ways in which the atrocities of slavery are still affecting so many with black or brown skin today, and how the relationship between the black and Jewish communities could perhaps assist in that progress. After all, I said, while we recognize that anti-Semitism is an extremely prevalent problem in today's world, because my family's skin was white, we were able to jump certain hurdles much easier than those whose skin was not. But as someone who usually tries very hard to use yes and rather than but, my while had served, had served as a but. And in my defense of a desire to support the movement, I had discounted a very real threat to my own people. In a strange form of cultural arrogance, I think too many people decided to disregard this and disregard attacks like it.
But if, on the one hand, we are going to say that sports stars should have a voice, I believe that means that they should be responsible with that voice, just as anyone with over a million people listening to him or her should be responsible with his or her voice. The words Deshaun Jackson shared with one and a half million followers are dangerous words. And I had subconsciously assumed that my people, the Jewish people, were solidly grounded enough that I didn't have to worry about us, at least not at that moment. And I was wrong. What Jackson had tweeted, regardless of who said it and regardless of what he thought it meant, put the current challenges of the black community on the backs of the Jewish people. And that's the kind of anti-Semitic rant, along with former NBA player and current sportscaster Stephen Jackson's Twitter response to a follower talking about the Rothschild's control of banks. That's the kind of anti-Semitic rant that helped lead Hitler to power almost 100 years ago. I'm using my voice this morning to suggest that we cannot tolerate it from sports stars, we can't tolerate it from politicians, we can't tolerate it from anyone. Yes, and. It always comes back to Hillel, author of the ultimate yes and wisdom. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? You might be tired of hearing me say it, but there's a reason we always go back to it. It's the constant reminder that we don't need a but. When we look at the world so often, we need a yes and. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Civil unrest is rarely good for the Jews. Anti-Semitism most often comes from those who are hurting the most, seeing Jews as the ones who are holding them down. It has happened throughout history. And this anti-Semitism is usually fed from other places, and it can be extremely dangerous. We cannot ignore it. Even if we view another's problems to currently be greater than our own, or perhaps especially when we view another's problems to be greater than our own. If we ignore that fire in the corner, it will spread. And if I'm only for myself, what am I? Civil unrest is caused by lack of hope. We are not responsible for the lack of hope, but we have to be a part of bringing that hope back. There are a lot of people who are suffering in our country, regardless of race or religion. And there are a lot of things that hold people back from achieving all that they'd be able to achieve in different circumstances. And it is unconscionable and unacceptable that having skin color that is not white still creates the stumbling blocks it continues to create today. My grandparents, I told you about them last year, Two World War II refugee immigrants, one in retail, the other a seamstress. They saved everything they had so that they could buy a house in the suburbs where they were able to gain equity. That equity that would help support my dad so he could support himself and ultimately support me. That house would become my family's inheritance and give me a boost as I went to college and later prepared to purchase my first home. But my grandparents could only afford that house at the end of the 1950s because they were given a mortgage. At the same time my grandparents had their mortgage approved, banks were systematically denying mortgages in growing black neighborhoods. I'll post a clip from the documentary Blacks and Jews to our Facebook page after the service along with Jamil Hill's article. But this video clip describes one neighborhood, Lawndale in Chicago and the disturbing history of black families who were manipulated and cheated out of everything they had as they thought they were buying homes in this predominantly Jewish area, and the rabbi and members of the Jewish community who fought against this abuse. The inability for so many families all around the country to build that same kind of support system that my family had would lead to setback after setback for generations 
And there were countless other hurdles that led to other setbacks. Many remarkably overcame them. And the effects of those set, but, but, and, 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 and the effects of those setbacks are still felt by too many today. And that's just one small piece of a large, extremely complicated puzzle. I would like to believe that we as Jews seeing this story are commanded to stand up for the statement that black lives matter. And I understand those who are challenged by the movement, fearing both anti-Semitic and anti-Israel rhetoric. Let me explain. The platform of the Movement for Black Lives, an organization affiliated with Black Lives Matter, states, the U.S. justifies and advances the global war on terror via its alliance with Israel and is complicit in the genocide taking place against the Palestinian people. Now, Jameel Hill's quote was a flippant attempt at a joke that displayed ignorance and an implicit bias. Deshaun Jackson's tweet was ignorant hate and irresponsible use of an anti-Semitic trope. But this statement contained a thought-out, contrived lie that took the word that was created to describe the atrocity against us in the Holocaust to unfairly compare the Jewish state to the Nazi one. It is okay to be critical of Israel and fight for change in Israel. But it is anti-Semitic to lie about the situation and to place the entire conflict on Israel's back. Hill suggests that black people's fight for their humanity is unrelated to Jackson's error. But they must use their own racial experiences to foster empathy for others. The thirst for liberation and equality can never come at the expense of dehumanizing other marginalized groups. As the leaders of Movement for Black Lives in such a flawed way tried to show empathy for another group, this anti-Semitic critique of Israel dehumanizes and marginalizes Jews in return. And the result is the growth and spread of an extremely dangerous, hateful lie. There are several things called for under the banner of Black Lives Matter with which I do not agree. And there are many actions that are being committed in the name of Black Lives Matter that we all agree should be condemned. And just as that small minority of Chicago Jews who took advantage of black families who wanted to live in the suburbs did not represent the Jewish community as a whole, this small segment should not keep us from continuing the historic Jewish role in the civil rights movement. When we disagree with our fellow human but we agree that all humanity is created in God's image and strive to love our neighbors as ourselves. We make that the starting point. We find more common values and we try to work out our differences from there so we can work together toward our common values. There are so many areas in our lives where we should look at our neighbor with whom we disagree and say, let's start with the values we agree on. What, what's at the core? How do we shape our lives? Then let's find the ones we have in common and try to learn about why we have differences from there so that then we can work together to further those common values. Maybe if there were more conversations like that, there would be a lot less division in our world. I would love to make some Zoom or phone coffee dates with anyone who would like to help me practice this kind of conversation. In Miss Hill's apology for her 2008 column, she ended by saying, I'm not going to stop writing about race. It's just that the next time I do, I'll be carrying an enhanced perspective. It's clear she has that perspective now. I learned a tremendous amount from her. And I wish more people who tweeted, posted, commented and shared their voice, whether it be with millions or tens, would strive for that enhanced perspective. I hope that I can approach, appreciate more nuance in the way in which I approach this discussion moving forward. And I pray that our community and the greater community can show concern for ourselves and concern for others without discounting either. 
I am extremely proud of our congregant and president of the Tampa JCCs and Federation, Joe Probasco, who as a citizen has worked with the Tampa City Council in writing and passing a race reconciliation resolution, apologizing for the slavery and discrimination that's a part of Tampa's history, and promising to work toward combating the remaining negative effects and promoting racial and social equity. This is a step in the right direction on so many levels, and it makes Tampa a model to the rest of our country. Thank you, Joe. And our own Laureen Jaffe and Mike Deason, hosts of the amazing podcast, The Third Opinion, which you all should subscribe to right now, have made this a focus of, this converse, of their conversation over the past few months. And um, I'm honored that I got to work with them on two panel discussions educating our community about other steps that can be taken to improve the current situation. Both of those conversations are available on the Temple's YouTube page, and I encourage you to watch them if you haven't yet. Joe, Mike, Laureen, and so many of our congregants who are elected officials and community leaders are working with so many partners to make real practical change in our community without letting national movements blur the true goals. And they are creating relationships and connections that will only strengthen our greater community as a result and prevent stereotypes and lies from entering our minds in the future. That's the conversation that I want to be a part of. This morning, remember, we read the story of the Akedah. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel tells in his autobiography of how he, as a seven-year-old child, read this or heard his rabbi telling the story of Abraham and Isaac, and he was weeping as he heard the story. He writes, Why are you crying? the rabbi asked. You know that Isaac wasn't killed. And I said to him, still weeping, But rabbi, what if the angel had come a second too late? The rabbi comforted me and calmed me, saying, an angel cannot come late. It was a nice moment, but Heschel's not one for nice moments. And he concluded the story in his autobiography with the realization that an angel cannot be late, but humanity made of flesh and blood may be. As Hillel's statement ends, if not now, when? Too many lives are being sacrificed, and this is the time. So I promise to continue the conversation with others in the Jewish community, the African-American community, and other partners throughout Tampa. I'm committed to continuing to be a part of this conversation moving forward, and I'm committed to ensuring that included as part of this conversation are steps to ensure that those stereotypes and hateful tropes of any kind are removed from it. And if any of you have questions or want to continue the conversation with me. Again, I am here to talk to any of you, anytime. There's a new phrase that has been recently coined. It's the opposite of cultural arrogance. It's cultural humility. The National Institute of Health defines cultural humility as a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique, whereby the individual not only learns about another's culture, but one starts with an examination of her or his own beliefs and cultural identities. May this year be a year in which we see our community and all communities continuing this process. May we all reflect, may we all critique, and may we all find ourselves humbled by the possibility that truth may be found in the nuance. And may our nuanced understanding help us to work with all of our neighbors to do our part to be God's partners in building a world of peace.